Hello, my name is Jupiter Hadley, and let me introduce you to the unofficial Game Maker Meetup, a monthly meetup event where we have talks around the many aspects of game development in general, as well as with Game Maker Studio, along with casual discussions and socializing with game developers. The meetup is organized and run in our spare time by Quang DX of Asobi Tech, Juju Adams, and myself, Jupiter Hadley. More info can be found on Twitter at GMM Meetup or Facebook on the unofficial Game Maker Meetup group. Here's one of our wonderful talks. Next. Hello everyone, um, I'm here today to talk about why I do game jams, uh, kind of a prefix to the game jam this weekend and also to share stories on how I worked with uh, Game Maker Studio. All right. There's some stuff about Unreal as well, I'm really sorry. I don't know if it's like, you know, sports teams where it's dangerous to talk about the other ones. So. Well, there we go, so yeah, I knew it. Um, first off, who am I? Uh, my name is Gary. Uh, I'm currently a game director at Supermassive Games in Guildford. Previous to that, I set up a VR studio for Sony in Manchester. Uh, before that, I was at Creative Assembly, where I worked on Halo Wars 2 and Alien Isolation. And then before that, Harry Potter series, Burnout and Spare Parts, and Black, and Family Game Night. And for every one of those games on there, there's at least one or two that I worked on that didn't make it out. So roughly, my history in games has been one, one made, one canned, one made, one canned. So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to see that that's actually a, quite a common case for a lot of my developer friends as well. So I've been working in the games for about 17 years now, which is far too long. And oh, I used to say, like, I've been in games eight years, and now I just feel old when I say it. But yeah, so uh, a lot of time spent with film IPs, uh, family games, you know, big, big franchises. But one of the things I love doing is game jams. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about how I made games before when I first started out, um, how I made games using Game Maker, uh, how I make games now, what I've made and why, why I jam as a conclusion, and then talk to you a bit about maybe you should think about why you jam, because it's an interesting approach. So, way, way, way back in around, I guess, 1998, 1999, uh, I wasn't in the game industry. I was actually as... Uh, Crane pointed out, a drummer in a heavy metal and hardcore band. So uh, we were going to you know, obviously take over the world and be incredible. Trouble is, we weren't very good. So uh, in my spare time, I was playing lots and lots of video games. Um, I would also make silly films with my friends, and I found I could use the Unreal Editor to create backdrops for the films I would make, uh, which was this kind of cool sci-fi blend thing. And I hung up a blue bed sheet and learned how to do blue screen. So, you know, very, very creative on that front. I used to use Flash to make little games and little experiments for my friends. Um, when I started in the industry, I started using in-house stuff like a RenderWare, a software called Candidate, and uh, Lightwave and MyBase stuff. So it was a very, very hard approach for me as someone who didn't actually have a background in programming or any kind of design or anything. It was, you know, I can play drums and know a bit about music and video editing. And I played a lot of games, but I didn't actually know how to build the game. So my, uh, I'd basically pick up any game with a level editor and try and teach myself how to use that stuff. Um, one of my favorites was Music 2000 on the PlayStation where you could create your own music and it was incredibly painful, but I could plug a headphone jack into the background and record it to like a mini disc and then plug another cable into that and make it into the film. So it was all very, very confusing. And then Game Maker came along. So I've been working in the game industry for quite a few years as a designer. And uh, one of my close friends, uh, a game designer called Catherine Woolley, she's one of the, the best designers you'll ever meet. She's so, so good. She's currently working on Dreams at uh, Media Molecule. But yeah, I worked with her on Harry Potter, on some of the stuff at EA. She was kind enough to let me know about what was going on at Creative Assembly. So I got to work with her on Alien as well, which is amazing. So yeah, so full props to Catherine. Look her up. She's on Twitter as Catmoo. Um, so she was telling me about game jams. And I'd done you know, filmmaking competitions and stuff like that, but I'd never really done any game jams. So I, you know, a lot of people say, I'm not sure about doing game jams because I don't know how to use the tools. I learned to use Game Maker on my first game jam. So I was already dropped in a deep end and trying to figure it out. I find it's the best way to learn it because you have to scrabble and learn as you go. It's really good fun. So after that game jam, I was absolutely mesmerized. I was just, just blown away by how cool it was to just make this game. And I started very, very quickly doing all the jams I could. So the ones I still do to this day are Ludendare and the Global Game Jam. So I always try and do those. I always do the solo competition for Ludendare, and I try and get together with Catherine and her sister and anyone else who wants to join in for Global Game Jam. But everyone's busy, we've all got older, so you know, the last couple we haven't quite made it. Um, so the big thing for me, this touches on a little of my background. How many people here use Game Maker quickly? Okay, this might be good, okay. so. Game Maker, for those of you who don't know, uh, you can use the Game Maker language and type a kind of XML sort of code-based script sort of stuff to make 
to make your games. I don't have a programming background. I'm someone who really can't connect with programming. I just look at a wall of text and I'm just, I can't, I, I don't see the matrix, you know, I can't get through to that stuff. If you give me something like a, you know, a flow chart or the type of logic you use in Little Big Planet, I can build wonders out of that. So I learned to use drag and drop in Game Maker, which is just pre-made functions you drop in. And it, it just helped me make games. And suddenly I found I could make all the things that were in my head and I wouldn't need to sketch it out and ask a programmer to make it for me. So that was a really, really big help for me. However, using drag and drop came with a certain amount of restrictions. Uh, this is me airing my massive mistakes in Game Maker, but it will hopefully help for you. Um, I was making a game called Space Awesome. Uh, it was a, a shooter where every now and again you could zoom into the spaceship itself and run around and go to sleep and make yourself a cup of tea and recharge the shields and then zoom back out and go to the shooting. Um, I wanted to put in a health system, so I needed a health bar. So I used my drag and drop knowledge to you know, build this health bar. Uh, I wanted to have health, health packs in there so that when you collected health, it, it filled it up, but I didn't want it to fill up entirely. I just wanted to fill up bit by bit. So the way I was doing it was I was creating, uh, I didn't know how to use variables, so I just figured out that I could count actors in the scene. So what I would do is, every time the ship got hit, I'd spawn a hit token, and the uh, health bar, every frame, would count how many hit tokens were in the world. Simple. However, the only bit of drag and drop language that would let me delete the hit tokens as getting your health back, um, deleted everything. It was just delete actor. So although it would give you full health, it wouldn't give you everything. So I needed to figure out a way that I could only do this a bit, which is when I came across the idea of using physics. So I created the hit tokens and they would fall. And then when you collected health packs, it would spawn anti-hit tokens, which would drop down and hit those. So I created a physics-driven health bar. <laughs> and it was all invisible behind the scenes. And I've told this to programmers, and they've just been pulling their hair out going, what are you doing? So, uh, so that was my first big discovery. And, and, but you know, I managed to get it working, so that was cool. Uh, I also created a game for my first game jam solo called Min Life, which was for Ludendare, and the, um, uh, the theme was minimalism. Uh, I had some frame rate issues in here, and this will be a kind of, you guys will see it before I even saw it through my description. Whereas a, a bug I couldn't figure out during the game jam was I had a shower sequence where you woke up in the morning, you got up, you walked past a cupboard, your clothes came off, you walked into a shower, the shower came on, you walked into another cupboard, your clothes came off, and you walked and you went and did your day. Uh, however, Whenever I hit the shower, the frame rate would drop quite a lot, and I never really figured out in the 48 hours why. Uh, another problem I had was that there was no transparency on my water sprite, which I thought was very, very strange. And the way I hooked it up was, using drag and drop, I did, on collision with shower, spawn sprite. Now, I didn't realize I did it every frame. And I also didn't know that you could count how many actors were in the scene either. So what was happening was I was stepping into the shower and it was just creating <laughs> literally hundreds and thousands of shower sprites. And that's also why they weren't transparent because they were all on top of each other. So this incredibly flat, non-detailed game ran at about three frames per second if you hung around in the shower. So anyway, figured that out and yeah, fixed that one and, and moved on. And that's how I learned about the drag and drop function for do once which is incredible and changed my life in Game Maker. Um, once I started using Game Maker to the point where actually I wasn't having issues like this, uh, I started using it at work. I was at Alien Isolation, uh, so working on Alien Isolation at Creative Assembly at the time. And what we were doing was we were designing some of the screen interactions and the hacking mini games. And the best way we figured out to do it was to actually design them in Game Maker, throw in all our own graphics, email it out to the team and just get everyone to play it and give their feedback on it and figure out how to work things out. And we created pretty much all of the initial stage concepts for pretty much all the hacking games and mini stuff that was in Alien Isolation using Game Maker. Um, it was really handy for us, but one of the, one of the big eye-opening things for us was there was a huge difference in people playing it at their desks and people playing it when they're in the game. And we found this out when there was people running away from the alien and all they had to do was put in a four-digit code on a wall and they'd run up and they'd be like, oh god, oh, one, oh no wait, three, oh god no, that's wrong. And we're like, if people can't enter in a four digit code, then our mini games can't be too cerebral. So we ended up scaling a lot of that back. Um, 
interestingly enough, one of the designers uh, who's the UI designer on that project has actually got his own studio and they're called No Code up in Scotland. And uh, he's just announced his own game called Observation and looks absolutely incredible. He also did the, the House Abandon and Stories Untold. I don't know if you guys yeah. have seen that. So it's just a quick uh, snippet from their thing. This was announced this week. And you can see some of the same sort of visual design from there, from like his, his history and his style. It's really, really come through in this game. So if you check out Observation, I'd really appreciate that. And so would John. Um, so how I make games now, uh, I use Unreal. I've learned to use Unreal through a series of experiments and catching up with things. Um, I work with blueprints. Uh, again, I don't know any code or scripting, so it's all very visual language, so I can just see where things connect, and I still make huge amounts of mistakes. Um, I create everything in the engine using BSP brushes, and then I just quickly export that to a static mesh that I can build, and I found doing that, I can make some absolutely incredible things. Um, it really allows a lot of non-technical designers to understand some of the basics of code uh, and then communicate better with the programmers on the team as well. Um, yeah, so no more physics-based health bars because I know what variables do now, which is wonderful. Um, moving between tools though, I found absolutely fascinating. I truly believe I wouldn't be able to use Unreal if I hadn't spent so much time learning Game Maker because a lot of the same principles are, are relevant there. So things like where you're storing logic, global variables, how objects talk to each other, managers, level scenes, things like that. Just getting the whole structure of a game in my head and learning that stuff was absolutely vital so that when I came across to Unreal, and I know a few friends have done the same, it's actually a very, very smooth transition for non-technical designers. Uh, debugging visually was absolutely wonderful, learning how breakpoints work and all that stuff was cool. And again, I still learn things now in Unreal that I could have done in Game Maker. Uh, so yeah, I, I haven't tried Game Maker Pro 2 yet, so maybe there's some more expanded drag and drop options. We'll see. So in Unreal 4, I've made a whole ton of games. Um, I made this crazy bombster one, which was for a theme about you are the monster, where you're flying around blowing up this dinosaur, but I made it so hard to play that more often than not you hit buildings instead of the monster and at the end it tells you your death casualty list compared to the monster and it turns out you're the monster, which was, you know, everyone rating it didn't play it to the end so they just gave me low scores. <laughs> um, uh, Galactic Growth Commander, which was this spaceship game where you choose to plant cities or forests on planets as you fly around. Cargo Shift was another spacey thing. The Museum of Time was this really moody piece I put together where uh, you're going through this underground museum trying to find out what's happened to the population of this planet and there's a lovely twist at the end. Breach Lockdown, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Genesis Planet Kit, which was based on this book I read as a kid about a, uh, uh, this kid in, like, who for his birthday or Christmas got this star building kit and you put stuff in it and it builds this little star in a chamber and it, this, this story like blew me away when I was a child because at the end of it, his star starts going wrong. So he starts putting bits from his bedroom in and stealing bits of bricks and iron from the house. And the end of the book is the chamber exploding and becoming a black hole and wiping out the earth. <laughs> I was like, so the game's nearly impossible to complete and more often than not ends in you making a black hole. But it's a shout out to the original book. So anyway, um, yeah, so I made a couple more atmospheric games, a game based on basketball, I'm a big fan of that. Skyward Pier and this, this recent game called Landscape. Um, now, I talked about Breach Lockdown. Now, Breach Lockdown was this game I did for the 48-hour jam. Now, as uh, most of you may or may not know, um, the Ludendare is split into two different competitions. There's a 48-hour challenge where you do it on your own, by yourself. You don't use any other assets. You create everything from scratch, and you do everything yourself. Then there's the jam, which is on, it's on the same period, but it's an extra day, so 72 hours. You can work in a team, you can use online assets, and it's more about you know, being expressive and, and making the things you want to make without the kind of hardcore pressure. Um, so I, in 48 hours, made this game called Breach Lockdown, which is this really intricate logic game about closing the right blast doors on a spaceship that was under attack from this big fleet before everything depressurized. And I procedurally generated all the nodes and the type of room you were in, so you could look on the wall and see the label, and if you closed the wrong room, your room would depressurize. And I gave it four different endings and its own soundtrack, and I put so much work into this. And then I finished at the end of the 48 hours. Uh, me and my wife went out to buy food and everything the next morning. I was a little hallucinating because of lack of sleep. And we went to Tesco's and we're picking up food, and she got this apricot cheese stuff. And I started singing this song that was in my head that I just made up that went, apricot drop for some crazy sleep deprived reason. So I sang it solidly for two hours. Uh, and then my wife said, you should turn that into a game. And we decided, actually, there's still time left to do something for the jam. So we should make another game. So my wife said, you are far too tired to do this. It's insane. Don't try and do it. 
And I was like, well, why don't you help me then? And she's like, ah. So she creates a profile on, on the Luden Dare site. I do the logic, she helps with some of the design, and we create this great game called Apricot Drop, which is very, very simple, where you have an apricot, you walk around with it, and you drop it. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> when it hits the ground, or when it hits a position, uh, I get to use the pointer. This whiteboard in the corner has a tick appear where you dropped it, so you dropped it on the floor, and you have to find places to drop the ap apricot that's new. Now, that in itself wouldn't have been that interesting, but in my sleep-deprived state, I decided it needed the song I'd been singing constantly, which goes like this. <laughs> so, it, it plays that every time you successfully drop the apricot somewhere new. And uh, so this game we made in what ended up being eight or nine hours has done better than any jam I've made in my life. <laughs> YouTubers reviewed this, and there's one guy called uh, Iwan Plays, and he plays like, you know, five, to, he's a bit like Jupy, he plays a lot of games in a row and streams them. And he played 20 entries, he played Apricot Drop fifth, and then sang the song for the rest of the 15. So I was like, it's clearly there. People still quote it to me and sing it to me, and I'm like, of everything I've made, <laughs> all the time I put into the detail and the people, and these, no, I just needed to make something cute with a fun theme tune. So, the question here is why I made all these jams and why, why I jam. Um, people ask me, you know, like, you work in AAA games, you're a game director, you have all this creative freedom to do what you like with the games, and you know what? That's not always true. You have to make a very specific type of game that's going to be, you know, not only a commercial success, but it's going to appeal to a very specific type of audience. Um, I've worked on a lot of games, family games, you know, alien games, racing games, puzzle games, sims, and all of them, you're trying to think about what people like about their game and what they're going to enjoy about it. And sometimes it's not what you enjoy, but understanding your target audience and how they're going to want to play it is important. Um, so you can't always express yourself. You can't always put the things you want to do. I quite like it finding little ways of putting in personality to a game and working with designers on the team who are fairly junior or been there a while and they want to put their own spark in the game and finding ways that they can get a bit of their own personality in there. Um, so for me, Game Jams is complete creative freedom. I can just forget whatever big project I'm working on and I can just make whatever I want in the time. I can you know, express myself and find interesting ways of saying the things I want to say um, and also adding personal touches. Um, uh, I have this thing where Years and years and years ago, a few designers and I, we always used to buy our own tea because the tea we used to get free at work wasn't very good. And we used to get Thai food. And the thing about Thai food is it comes in four packets. And when we said, why does it come in four packets? Someone said, oh, obviously it's made in space. So we call it space tea. So we've always drunk space tea and that's the thing. So that's kind of become my thing. And in every single game I've made, I always put a little red mug of space tea somewhere. And all my, my friends who know my jams and play them are always trying to find where this red space tea is in, in most of the games. So, um, I also love to try and increase my skills and understanding. One of the first things I figured out when I was doing a game jam on my own was how much of a jerk I'd been as a designer asking for things from animation and audio and other departments because I didn't know what their job was about. Um, I was working on this cowboy game uh, where I'd created a character and I created enemies and I'd had on my list create death animations. No problem, I'll do that. And at one point while I was going, a bit of feature creep, I was like, oh, you know what? I want eight different types of enemies. If I create eight enemies and they've all got different sprites and they all do different actions and have different weapons, that would be brilliant. No problem, created the eight enemies. Got to about halfway through day two and I was like, right, I'm gonna do that death animation for now nine characters. I was like, something that was gonna take me five minutes is now gonna take me more time than I have left. And I was like, oh, of course. That's why everyone shouts at me when I ask for stuff. <laughs> so it really helped me understand the other perspectives from all the people making the game. What I ended up doing for that game was actually creating like a death shadow that I could apply to all of them. So it also helped me come up with more creative ways to solve things in games that wouldn't impact so many people on the team. Um, this is a bit of an interesting point that does divide a lot of people. Um, I tend to treat game jams a bit like those Tough Mudder courses and those marathons that people do where they test themselves and they really see what they're physically capable of. I don't agree with working crunch. I don't agree with people being forced to work late hours and do extra stuff to make the games they want to make. But I've had some of the most incredible moments working in games where me and a few other people who are so excited about the thing we're working on 
want to stay late and we want to put in extra effort and we want to make the thing that we want to do. But that is so dangerous because you do that too much, you burn yourself out. You know, if the company's not there to support you or, you know, it's not safe, there's so many issues that can happen. So if you're at a studio that is there to encourage that if you want to do it, it can be some of the best moments in game, in, in game development I've ever had. So doing game jams, for me, I literally test myself physically and mentally where I do as minimal sleep as I possible can. I do this thing called polyphasic sleep patterns where you work for three hours and sleep for half an hour and then work for another three. It really messes with your head, but you get so much done. <laughs> so, when, so when I hit the points in game development that's you know, near, near a big deadline and I think, oh my God, I could just do this little thing. If I could just spend a couple more hours doing this, I know a lot better idea of how many mistakes I'm going to make, whether I've got the energy, whether I've got the, you know, the mental aptitude to deal with it. And also, being a father of two now, I'm actually much better on lack of sleep, I strongly believe, because of game jams. <laughs> um, so yeah, learning my limits as well, figuring out via that process how long I can go, you know, how long before I start making mistakes, because there's, there's diminishing returns the more kind of late hours and crunch you do. So this brings to the big question of why. Why I make games and why I do jams and why I've chosen this as my career and you know, it's, it's a kind of a much larger discussion. Um, it's a strange one, but to make the world a better place. Uh, I firmly believe that the best people for the job should be doing the job. I'd love to work for NASA, but I'm not good enough. So what I can do is make video games and I can make video games that are gonna inspire people to go on and do better things. Um, I had a chat in one of my early, early games uh, while I was working late with you know, some, some, uh, some members of the team. And uh, I was fresh in and wide-eyed and you know, really excited about what I was working on. And you know, the dev manager I was with, he was talking to me and uh, I said, oh, it's absolutely great. And he said, why, why do we do this? It's, it's, you know, it's 11 o'clock, we're still here doing this. I said, we're doing this because some girl or some guy you know, in a couple of years time is going to be playing this in their bedroom on the other side of the country and they're going to have no friends and they're going to play this and it's going to open up their world and they're going to be inspired and they're going to do on and go on and do incredible things. And he was like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's I never even thought about it like that. And I was like, you said, that's, that's, that's the way we do it. And he said, well, I've got a bit more of a grounded view. And I was like, okay, well, what do you think? And he said, well, imagine there's, I don't know, a big disaster or a nuclear war tonight and they're safeguarding the future of humanity and they're putting everyone in bunkers, you know, doctors, nurses, politicians and stuff. Do you think we'd get in? <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> and he was like, we kind of make stuff to distract people. And I'm like, ah. So I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I've had a lot of my career, career trying to create things that have a lot of meaning and have a lot of impact within a fairly corporate structure where you're dealing with IPs and audiences and, you know, target audiences and platform holders and trying to keep everybody happy while making something that's got integrity and it's got some kind of inspiring content. Um, this one's a surprising one, a game I'm hugely proud of. Uh, I get asked a lot from junior designers like, you know, you worked on Alien, you worked on Halo Wars, all this stuff, you know, what's your best game? One I'm hugely, hugely proud of is this game Family Game Night. Now, it was, it was Connect 4 and Boggle on the Wii and we took it to Xbox Live. It had Scrabble in it and Battleships, it was like, I mean, it's just taking a bunch of board games and putting them on. We created new modes for them and stuff, and we made a cool front end with Mr. Potato Head running around and waving, you know. But I got so many letters and emails after making this game from parents who were like, this game has allowed me to connect with my kids. I was like, God, just, just that is just absolutely amazing because they're able to learn the controls. And they were laid to this, this thing with all these buttons on they never could touch before. I know Boggle, I know Connect 4, I can give this. So that one's left and right, that one's A. And now they're playing games with their kids. And now kids are connecting with their parents and they're a family unit again. And it's not just the kids over there and I'm doing my thing. It was just, I was just so, so blown away with that. I just couldn't believe it. This, this one thing I'd done has made a difference to a lot of people. And it sold an incredible amount. So I'm hoping the effect was a lot bigger than that. Um, Alien Isolation, I did, a, you know, very, very proud of this game, huge success. Um, but the one thing I did not expect that I was incredibly proud of is the amount of emails, articles, and letters that, that kind of circulated that people talked about playing this game uh, enabled them to deal with anxiety. It was a safe space. They could explore these things they were struggling with and actually get better at it in their lives and kind of you know, understand it and toy with these things that they normally would be absolutely afraid of to do. And there's some incredible articles about this and I, I just could not believe that effect. It's not even something I even considered when designing this game. But the fact that it had that positive effect and had such a deep meaning for these people made such a, such a difference to me on that. Um, so actually for me, 
the whole design and aspect of making games and making things is to inspire, to like capture imagination of people, you know, provide an escape and you know, encourage thought, get people talking and discussing things. I love it when games do things that you're not expecting and that makes people think about their day-to-day -day lives you know, and think about things they'd never even considered. And for me, that's a huge part of why I do it. So I guess my question to everyone here is, why do you guys game jam? And a lot of people do it because their friends do it. Some people do it because they want to do skills. You know, there's millions of reasons why people can think of to jam. But if you can drill down to a core, solid reason of why you want to create these things, you know, is it to just be something fun? Is it something emotional you want to you know, convey? Is it something inspiring or something impactful? Or do you want to convey something personal about you know, your own lives or something you've experienced and you want to share that with everyone? Figuring out what that is, is a vital, vital thing. And if you can do that in a game jam, that's even better because I, you know, part of the Ludum Diary is judging other people's games and playing as many as you possibly can. And I go through those and it's really easy to see the ones that stand out because they have personal touches and they have a personal message in them. And they have such a huge impact when you get that right. So I'd say think about that a lot. Think about getting that into your game and make something from the heart that you think is going to do the best. That's it from me.